This is a production of Cornell University. So first, thank you very much to the graduate students of Plant Breeding for inviting me. It's always fun to give a seminar to colleagues here on the Ithaca campus, but it's especially nice to be invited by graduate students. Uh, faculty love that, so <laughs> it is really nice. Um, also, I apologize that I missed lunch. I thought lunch was after the seminar, because that's what we do in plant pathology, so I hope you had a great lunch without me. <laughs> I'm a little bit sad about that, I have to admit. Um, so I guess there's food in Michael Mazurik's lab that I can snag afterwards. <laughs> uh, today, I, I'm going to break a, a bunch of rules that I give my graduate students when I help them develop their seminars. Um, the first rule being you should never talk about one, more than one pathosystem. It just gets too confusing and everyone gets confused. But with the title, um, A Tale of Two Phytophthora, you can uh, get the idea that I am going to be talking about two pathosystems today and we'll see how that goes. So um, uh, the symptoms that you see on the title slide here are symptoms of the two pathosystems uh, here on the left-hand side is Phytophthora blight caused by Phytophthora capsicy. And in the center and on the right-hand side, you see uh, Phytophthora infestans, which causes late blight of potato and tomato, which is infamous uh, for being the pathogen involved in the Irish potato famine. So uh, before I really got into the projects, I did want to mention um, a little bit about some of the other projects ongoing in my lab. In case any of you folks are interested, I'd be uh, happy to discuss. I am a vegetable pathologist. My job is to study all of those diseases that occur above ground on vegetables in the state of New York. And there seems to be more and more every year. Um, for a lot of years, I worked on bacterial and oomycete pathogens. And we still have some bacterial projects. Uh, we look at, work a lot on cabbage. Cabbage is a major vegetable crop grown, he grown here in New York. Um, and then tomato also, uh, bacterial speck and bacterial canker. In bacterial canker, we have some interesting projects looking at the movement of the pathogen within the plant. We do, uh, as Lauren said, a lot on pathogen detection. And then population studies today, I'll talk about uh, Phytophthora capsicea and infestans. We do, as uh, again, Lauren said, we also work on cucurbit downy mildew. And then in recent years, I've started some projects on the true fungi, um, uh, including alternary leaf spot on brassica crops, um, brown leaf mold on tomato, which hits uh, high tunnel tomatoes particularly hard. And uh, the newest project in my lab is a uh, Melampsora rust project. It's a uh, willow rust on shrub willow, uh, which is now a vegetable in the state of New York. Um, so, <laughs> um, so uh, I also do a lot of work with growers. I spend about half of my time working with uh, growers and uh, helping them manage and control their diseases in both conventional and organic production. I have a very large outre outreach program uh, to the general public, including home gardeners, uh, community gardens, and uh, K-12 project. This is our uh, local K-12 project. We help the elementary school with their garden. And then um, this semester, I'm teaching a course called Skills for Public Engagement. So on to the Phytophthora. Uh, on the left, we have Phytophthora blight. On the right, we have late blight. Uh, you might think that they're very similar diseases. They look pretty similar in culture while they grow on different media. They look fairly similar. The symptoms you see here, uh, both on this tomato leaf and on this pumpkin, are the asexual spores of the pathogen. Both pathogens are oomycetes. They're not true fungi. Please don't call them true fungi. They're in an entirely different kingdom. And even though they look in culture like a true fungus, they're really a very, very different type of organism. I'll bring out some of those differences as the talk goes on. The host range of the two pathogens uh, is, is really quite different, and that's the first area that really separates the two out here in New York and, and elsewhere. Um, Phytophthora capsicy has a much broader host range, so it attacks all cucurbits, almost all of the solanaceous crops, but not potato, uh, snap beans, and a whole diverse array of weeds. Here are some of the symptoms uh, showing fruit rots here on the bottom of the slide. I should be using this so people in Geneva can see. Um, and on the right-hand side um, is the host range of Phytophthora infestans. It does have a much more limited host range. Um, the big ones are potato and tomato. It also goes to petunia, the nightshade weeds, um, all these solanaceous guys. 
Uh, Nicosiana benthamiana is a popular lab rat uh, for P. infestans work. Um, but with, even within the solanaceous, it does not attack pepper or eggplant. Um, I think the fact that infestans doesn't in attack pepper or eggplant and uh, capsaicy does not attack potato is really fascinating. And that's one of the areas that I'd really like to study um, over the next 20 years. But I'm not right now. Um, so when I, I was talking to some breeders about this, and, and someone actually told me, uh, it broke my heart, but someone actually told me, please, please, please don't show us those darn life cycles. We don't care. <laughs> and, and I totally care, but I, don't get the, I get that you guys don't care, so I'm just going to show you the highlights. If you need more, come see me. Uh, so there are some really important aspects of the life cycles in New York of both of these pathogens. Each pathogen is heterothallic. That means you need two mating types in order to make the sexual st overwintering structures. So um, we cleverly call the mating types A1 and A2. Each mating type can make both the male and female parts, but you have to have both of those mating types in order to get the overwintering sexual spores. With Phytophthora capsaicae, every field we tested has both mating types. We have a sexually reproducing overwintering population throughout the state of New York. In Phytophthora infestans, the late blight pathogen, this is a very clonal population in the US. That is, while in Mexico and other parts of the world, both mating types exist and you have sexually reproducing populations, here in the US, our populations are clonal. In any given year, we'll have one or two or three clonal lineages that um, predominate the epidemics that we see, but we don't only rarely see, only rarely do we see sexual reproduction. So we don't have O spores in the soil. So capsaicy, life cycle, it overwinters in the soil. Infestans, not so much. Um, so asexual reproduction is really, really important. Uh, Phytophthora, the direct translation is plant destroyer. And the reason Phytophtheras are such excellent plant destroyers is because of their explosive asexual reproduction capabilities. So uh, these are sporangia. These are what that white fuzz on the tomato leaf or that uh, powdered sugar appearance on the fruit. Those are the asexual sporangia. Under the right conditions, uh, each sporangium will produce zoospores that can swim. Capsaicy, when, when these guys get wet, will produce 20 to 40 swimming zoospores, whereas in festans, that'll be six to eight. Zoospores are incredibly interesting structures, and I won't bore you with immense amount of details, but there are a couple of cool things that you need to know. Um, zoospores, on their abaxial surface, they have two flagella, they're biflagellate, which makes them unique among many modal structure, modal spores in nature. So they're biflagellate, and the anterior flagellum is actually tinselated, and the posterior is not. The anterior flagellum actually pulls the zoospore forward. Right, you know, in most swimming spores, you have a flagellum, and it acts like a tail, and it moves along. But that is totally not how these guys work. They do the front crawl. And the posterior flagellum actually acts as a rudder. And in some species, they're chemotactic. So that rudder can direct them directly to the root zone where they want to attack and kill the plant. So all my seeds are cool. <laughs> so how do they spread? So uh, Phytophthora capsaicae, being that it's in the soil, it spreads in the soil, with movement of soil, and with water. Uh, Omycetes, the common name would be a water mold, and these guys really do love water. Capsaicy will move wherever water moves it and wherever someone moves the soil. Thankfully, there is no aerial dispersal. They cannot move through the air. And that is really one of the Achilles heel of this pathogen that enables us to manage it at all in New York. Uh, Capsaicy, uh, as I said, it can move in water, whether it's splash dispersal of water, flood waters, uh, and then on soil, cultivation between fields, and on movement of inf infected fruit, which is a very common way that it gets moved from farm to farm. Infestans, 
it is all about that aerial dispersal. This is a picture of a tomato leaf, and you see the sporangia on the bottom there. They're these tiny lemon-shaped guys, and they actually stick up off the leaf surface. And when the humidity changes, so for example, <coughs> if I had a detached leaflet in a petri dish, high humidity, took that lid off, you decrease the humidity, the sporangia actually twist. It's completely awesome. They twist and they dehiss or they break off from the sporangiophore on the leaf. And that's how they become airborne and they can fly for miles in the wind. So the methods of dispersal of these two pathogens are very different. So uh, the infestans, because it's aerially dispersed and it's not in the soil, then how, how does it survive here in New York? Well, it tends to survive over winter in potato tubers. So the, tu the pathogen can live inside that tuber that might be left in the soil or sitting in a coal pile. Um, it also uh, can get around by movement of infected plants, tubers, fruit, and sadly by humans, sometimes in trucks. As we saw in 2009, many of your tomatoes may have died from late blight. Uh, that was due to movement of infected tomato transplants in trucks. So one of the things that I have to do every year as part of my job is when there is a total crop failure, as is seen with Phytophthora capsaceae on this acorn squash here on the left, or with this potato field and Phytophthora infestans on the right, I tend to get called out by the extension educators to the field, talk to the grower, try to figure out what went wrong, how we can fix it in the future. And that's a really hard thing to do because I'm standing there trying to educate, but I get paid whether or not their crop dies, and this person is dealing with a significant ec economic loss. So one of the things that I have come to realize is that it's after these experiences of interacting with growers after significant crop loss, on that drive home, that's when I really tend to come up with the questions that my lab is focusing on now. So the questions, many of the questions in my lab are really driven by crop failures in the field and trying to figure out what can we do to, you know, to study and find out more information to prevent this into the future. Let's see. So here are some of the questions that I'm going to cover today um, with Phytophthora capsaceae, which has both sexual and asexual reproduction in the field. Um, questions that growers always ask. You guys will be heartened to know that no matter the disease, growers almost the first thing they ask is, are there resistant varieties? So your work is being used. <laughs> Please continue to breed resistant varieties. Um, uh, then in, in terms of Phytophthora capsaceae, Phytophthora blight, you know, what happens when the pathogen arrives? I have it on my farm. You tell me it's mine to keep. It's not going anywhere. What do I do now? How long will the pathogen stay in the soil? A uh, really commonly asked question, is the pathogen resistant to the fungicides that I use? And will the pathogen be able to overcome that host resistance that you're suggesting that I use? With Phytophthora infestans, because the pathogen really doesn't survive on farm, unless you're keeping tubers that you shouldn't be keeping, uh, the common questions are, what strain of the pathogen do I have? Because we have these asexual clonal lineages, people want to know, um, what strain do I have? Because we know, based on the clonal lineage, is it, does it prefer potato or tomato? What fungicide is it resistant? That clonal lineage gives us some information about that strain of the pathogen. Are there resistant varieties? Uh, again, uh, what about fungicides? Uh, where does the pathogen come from every year? That is a question that um, advisory panels ask, growers, panel, gr growers ask, where does this come from? Um, and then uh, again, will the pathogen be able to overcome host resistance? And um, with Phytophthora infestans, sadly, there is a very long history of the pathogen relatively quickly overcoming host resistance. Uh, so, we'll start with our sexually reproducing Phytophthora capsaceae that causes Phytophthora blight. Stay with me. We're going to have a, a little series on Phytophthora blight now. Um, 
I started working on Phytophthora blight in 2006 because there had been uh, several large outbreaks. The pathogen had been in New York for decades, um, but just a, a small problems in up upstate New York with significant problems down on Long Island. However, um, starting in 2004, 2005, there was some really big epidemics, and the reason for that is because around that time we started to have a change in our climate. Rather than having a quarter inch of rain a week throughout the summer, we got large rain, ex rain events that, that Art Degatano calls extreme weather events, where we would get two or more inches of rain at a time. So with a water mold, you can imagine that if you get two or more inches of rain at a time, flooding and puddling in fields, those water molds go crazy. And once you get an outbreak on one or two farms, then because the pathogen moves in water and in diseased fruit and on tractor tires, it really starts to spread around. So what we have learned since we started working on it is that, uh, as I said earlier, we have sexually reproducing populations in every field in New York that we've tested. Uh, the pathogen is very genetically diverse, which is not surprising given that it's sexually reproducing. Um, there are regional differences in fungicide sensitivity, which is interesting. Um, in the eastern side of New York, we have some fungicide resistance to a very commonly used fungicide, whereas in the western part of New York, we don't. Um, we, have, we did a significant survey. I had a student work on trying to figure out what, what waters, surface waters in New York, uh, Phytophthora capsicea could be found in, and we could find it, she could find it almost everywhere. Um, irrigation ponds, streams, the Erie Canal, which people use for irrigation. So any irrigation source, we could find the pathogen um, present in floodwaters. Oh boy, after um, hurricane remnants from Irene and Lee and then Superstorm Standy, there were many, many farms in eastern New York that had never had Phytophthora capsicea before that now have the pathogen. Uh, we learned something about resistance, working with Michael Mazurik in his lab. We know that some pr pepper varieties are resistant to New York isolates. We're working on getting more. But there is currently no commercially available uh, resistance in cucurbits. And again, uh, along with uh, Michael Mazurik and Mike Gore, we're, we're working on that and trying to identify some resistance in the cucurbits. So that takes out some of our questions, but some of the questions still remain. What happens when the pathogen arrives into a new field that had never been infected before, and how long will that pathogen stay in the soil? So one of the really interesting things about this project is that the growers in the state of New York, especially upstate, were really wanting someone at Cornell to study Phytophthora capsicea. Meg McGrath down on Long Island had, has done a lot of work, but the soils are different there, the climate is different there, and no one on on either the Ithaca or Geneva campuses had been working on this pathogen. One of the reasons is that none of Cornell's land was infested with the pathogen. And it, I found out that you know, those horticultural scientists and plant breeders aren't that enthusiastic about the plant pathologist inoculating our Cornell land with a pathogen that has an extremely broad host range that never goes away. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> I was shocked. Um, so uh, the growers actually worked together with um, legislators in Albany and we had a blight farm built in Geneva, New York, about a quarter of a mile from my office, which is totally awesome. There, was some, there were nine acres of very swampy land that Cornell was happy to have me use for a blight farm. You can see an aerial photo of it there on the uh, left. This is an outline of the blight farm here. We do a lot of pepper trials. You can see, a little shout out to the Mazurik lab. These are uh, the controls, and these are some of Mazurik's peppers there, looking pretty good. Um, and we have a barn. So because the pathogen uh, survives in the soil, you don't want to use the equipment that the plant breeders and the horticultural scientists might use. So we have uh, equipment, a barn, anything that we might need to do trials on our nine-acre nine farm is part of the farm, stays there. So that's where we have been doing research. Uh, okay. But that soil did not have any of the pathogen in it either. <coughs> so how do you inoculate a farm with a pathogen? You know, there's not actually that much scientific literature on that. <laughs> Again, I, I, we searched. Um, but in 2008, we came up with this idea that thankfully worked. Um, we grew uh, two 
different strains of the pathogen, the A1 and the A2, the two mating types, in um, big five liter flasks that were filled with vermiculite that had been saturated with V8 juice. This pathogen loves V8 juice, so we had, I think we had 50 flasks of each isolate growing in sterile conditions and inoculated them. And then we took those and we mixed them up in these very uh, scientific plastic garbage bags. <laughs> and we took that cocktail and spread it around this beautiful, beautiful pumpkin patch. It was an absolutely gorgeous pumpkin patch on September 8th. And October 9th, we had victory. <laughs> so I have to admit that uh, while I, it, I truly hate seeing this on a grower farm, on our research farm, this is absolute victory. <laughs> so we were really excited and happy that we had killed this pumpkin patch. Um, all of the plant breeders and horticultural scientists were a little bit nervous when they saw this, and they were thankful that we were on our farm. Um, but this was the start of a biparental population that we have studied over time. This is Marin Carlson's uh, slide, and I, I use it. It's just absolutely fantastic to demonstrate what we're looking at in this particular field. So we have our victory field here on the left that was inoculated with the A1 and the A2 strain. So in 2008, it was inoculated. And then in the spring of 2009 is the first time we started to collect isolates. We collect isolates by planting a susceptible host in the field. They get diseased. We bring some of that diseased tissue in, culture the pathogen, and that's how we get the strains. The tricky thing is we really don't know the generation of the pathogen in the field. Because those oospores can survive in the field for a very long time, you can have an F1 O spore from the first year germinate and mate with an O spore that was produced in 2012. So we really don't know anything about who's mating with whom after that first inoculation. So what are we doing in our biparental field population? Really, one of the things we really wanted to ask was how long will a founding O spore population survive? Um, do we observe generations? Can we observe generations over time? Is there selfing? Um, so the way we did this was we collected somewhere between 30 and 50 isolates each year uh, from 2009 to 2015. And in the beginning, uh, my graduate student Amara Dunn used microsatellite analysis. There was a paper from South Africa that had five microsatellite loci, which remarkably was more than enough for us to identify variation in the population. She saw uh, variation in genotypes, irregular patterns of inheritance, which is not unusual for the genus Phytophthora, um, and appearance of novel alleles within three, three years, novel microsatellite alleles. We also did an F1 cross in the lab to use as a control to know what an F1 population actually looked like, but we knew that we needed more than five markers. So when you need more markers, what do you do? You do GBS. <laughs> That's what we do, right? So uh, we, since that time, Marin Carlson took over the project, and we have 157 individuals from the field, 43 individuals from our F1 lab cross, and um, we've done genotyping by sequencing. Um, the genome of Phytophthora capsicae is about 64 megabases. Uh, we used APEK1, which seemed to work fine for our purposes. Um, some people that are working with Phytophthora find that APEK1 doesn't give them enough cut sites, but it, it was fine for our purposes. Um, Marin was able to identify about 400,000 SNPs before filtering, and after her filtering, um, we're now using about 6,500. So what do we see? Again, uh, Marin's data. Uh, we have the A1 parent in blue up on the top, the A2 parent on the bottom. This is a principal components analysis. Um, with those 6,500 SNPs. And uh, what you see th is different colored dots um, ranging from 2009 to 2013, <coughs> which is how far we've gotten to date. And then in magenta are the products of the lab cross that we know are F1. So happily, we saw sort of what we expected to see more or less from a, popul a biparental population. The progeny are somewhere in between the two parents. There's a couple of interesting uh, individuals here. 
Uh, these are actually three individuals from the lab cross that Amara, uh, my previous student, had identified with the five loci to be selfed, and uh, Marin found the same thing. Uh, and then these were two that uh, had not been previously identified, and these are actually uh, from the field, individuals from the field that are also identified as selfs. That is, uh, one parent mating with itself because uh, in the heterothalicomycete, each individual can produce both the oogonium, the female part, and the anthridium, the male part. They can self. Um, and so that's, that's how uh, we got those individuals out there. Kind of interesting. Marin has done some really interesting work on those. Uh, but for the purposes of this seminar, what we were really looking for was how long do those original founding oospores stay in the field? So what we have in this violin plot is our F1s on the right-hand side. We know that they're F1s. Um, the first time we were able to collect isolates was 2009. Uh, and so in 2009 and 2010, uh, the heterozygosity, which is what you're looking at here, uh, was very similar to what we saw with F1s. Starting in 2011, this is really great, um, what we see is that there are some individuals that have a level of heterozygosity similar to that of the F1s, but then we're starting to see some individuals that have less heterozygosity which would be an indicator of inbreeding. What we also see is as we move into 2012 and 2013, is again a reduction in heterozygosity, so we're looking at inbreeding. And now, while this isn't really surprising, this is actually the first time that we've been able to show this for a field population of Phytophthora capsaceae. So it's really kind of exciting. It'll be really fun to see what happens in the next several years if we continue uh, to see a reduction in heterozygosity or if it levels off because we are selecting for those individuals that can kill a plant, right? We, we only can collect isolates on a plant that is dying from symptoms. So because we're selecting, we're probably losing individuals that are no longer pathogenic. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in this field. So uh, what have we learned from our GBS with the biparental population? Uh, we have found that the founding oospores stay for about three years. Based on Marin's work, there are, there are individuals that appear to be F1s for about three years, um, and the inbred oospores uh, are there for longer. And then uh, how, so that's what happens when it arrives, and that's also how long we think the pathogen will stay in the soil. Now, Again, because of selection, um, we, we don't know that this is exactly what would happen in a grower's field, but we do hope to compare these data to what we see in a grower's field uh, as time goes on. So what's next in, with the Phytophthora capsaceae, which has the sexual reproduction? Well, we need additional studies um, on the genetics, actually, Marin is doing a lot of really fascinating additional studies on the genetics of this biparental population. So I said earlier, Phytophthora capsaceae is known to have um, interesting genetics. Um, so uh, she's actually able to use this population to learn more about loss of heterozygosity, gene conversion, um, and, and it's, it's really uh, been fun to learn more about the pathogen in this field setting. Uh, as I said, we also want to compare our research field to grower fields. Sadly, there are more than enough grower fields for us to compare to. Um, and then uh, Marin is actually doing uh, an association study to look for a region associated with mating type. Um, but there are other phenotypes that we will certainly want to look for in the future, uh, such as fungicide resistance or uh, effectors that enable um, the pathogen to more effectively attack the host. So, we are now going to switch gears and talk about asexual reproduction for a little while. So this is a whole new system, similar yet completely different. So, we're switching to pea and festans. It's aerially dispersed, but there's, and <laughs> people have been studying Phytophthora and festans for 165 years, but it's still one of the most feared pathogens of tomato and potato growers across the world. It, it's, it's a frustrating system to work with. Research are, researchers are frustrated and growers are frustrated. So one of the biggest questions that the first question a grower asks is, what strain do I have? 
as I said earlier, because these are asexual, uh, asexually propagated, you have these clonal lineages, and um, people want to know what strain do I have, because that will help them know what fungicides to use, what host to plant, things like that. Are there resistant varieties? Uh, is the pathogen resistant to commonly used fungicides? And this is a very interesting question. Where does the pathogen come from every year if it's not coming from our soil? Um, and then finally, will the pathogen be able to overcome the host resistance? So these are data from Bill Fry's lab. And um, he, as, as many of you know, is probably the, the world expert in research on Phytophthora infestans. And one of the things that Bill's lab has studied for a very long time are these clonal lineages, these asexually reproducing populations. And what this slide shows is uh, his ability to identify quickly clonal lineages and the change in clonal lineages, lineages over time. So, for example, in the potato graph, we have from 2009 to 2014, as we do in the tomato graph, each color is a different asexually reproducing population or clonal lineage. So uh, the bottom line from this slide is that yes, clonal lineages change over time, and yes, we can fairly rapidly identify them. Starting in 2011, we really had a boost in our ability to understand what's going on with Phytophthora infestans because um, a large group of us, about 28 labs across the country, were involved in a USDA CAP grant. And Bill Fry's portion of that, one of his uh, projects as part of that, was that people from around the country sent Phytophthora infestans isolates to his lab and he genotyped them using um, microsatellites. He genotyped them within 24 hours and got that information back to them. Now this was great for people because they would know what clonal lineage they were working with, but it was also great for us because suddenly we had this huge collection of isolates with which we could work. As part of the project, um, several labs around the country all also took that uh, isolate collection and tested them for sensitivity to commonly used fungicides. So the resistant varieties, there, there are resistant varieties which the pathogen frequently can overcome. Um, actually, breeders are working, especially in tomato, on increasing the number of resistant varieties. There's some really nice uh, R genes in tomato that are being bred into lots of different uh, commercially available varieties now, which is great. Um, but the question that remained that we wanted to look at was, where does the pathogen arrive from every year? So Zach Hansen, one of my graduate students, uh, has been working on this project. And again, we, we wanted to use some method to understand if we could identify individuals within that asexual clonal lineage. So these would be um, mutations that occurred over time through mitosis, right? Completely asexually. Um, and we wanted to know if we could identify variation, and if so, could we identify sublineages or, or variants that we could track across the country? Uh, and the reason we wanted to do this is that we hope that it will better enable us to understand how epidemics start, right? So do they start from some source of inoculum that's a potato tuber in a home grower, home gardener's, you know, backyard? Or are they starting from transplants that get moved by truck or potato tuber seed that gets moved around the country? Uh, again, this was part of our CAP grant. It was a huge community effort. Um, we looked at, we, Zach, looked at 257 isolates from four different clonal lineages. Clonal lineages are named, uh, they started with US 1, they're named by the country that you first identify them in, and then uh, chronologically as new lineages come along. So US 8 is the oldest lineage that we looked at. Uh, it first appeared in the 1990s, and we looked at also US 11, US 23, and US 24. Most of the isolates were from between 2011 and 2014 because that was the time period of the grant that we were working on. Those were submitted to Bill's lab. He genotyped them, saved them away, and those are the isolates that we used for this particular study. So, uh, Zach was able to uh, use APK1 again, identify SNPs within lineages, and the first thing um, we wanted to do was look at 
uh, the genetic differences within a lineage. So our hypothesis would be that the oldest lineage, US 8, would have the, the most diversity of isolates within that lineage because it's been around the longest. Um, and when Zach went through the culture collection, uh, we were able to get by far the largest number of isolates from the clonal lineage to US 23. The reason for that is for the last three years, that's almost the only lineage that we've seen in North America. So anybody who sent in an isolate, it's going to be US 23. Uh, and he had between 20 and 30 of the other three lineages. Um, you can also see here, um, after filtering, the number of SNPs that were identified and used in these analyses. And um, the oldest lineage did have um, the highest level of diversity, um, but even that was really not, it, there's not a huge amount of diversity as one might expect within a clonal lineage, but we did identify some diversity. Uh, he did do an experiment where he used the exact same isolate um, and uh, performed GBS um, seven different times. And um, so that was sort of our background control. And this uh, 0.043 was the level of diversity sort of within our control group. So that was sort of our background. If it's not higher than that, um, we know it, it's, it's not worth looking at. So Zach also did a principal components analysis. And on the entire um, group of 257 isolates, and thankfully and happily, um, we, he was able to uh, differentiate the four clonal lineages that we're working with. It was known prior to this study that the two lineages, US 8 and US 24, were fairly closely related. So we knew that the, the system was working at least at some level. Um, what I'm going to show today is actually um, only the data from the US 23 clonal lineage because we had 166 isolates and, and this really um, gave us the most interesting story. With only 20 to 30 isolates, we really did not have enough data to, to try to look at um, regional differences compared to annual differences. But with the US 23 isolates, um, in this particular neighbor joining tree, um, that they're categorized by collection year. And um, you can't really see very many yellow. 2009 was the first year that uh, the clonal lineage US 23 was identified. We only had two isolates from that inaugural year. Um, three isolates from 2010. You can see here that two of the three isolates from 2010 clustered together. Uh, but then again, because of this grant and people sending isolates in, in 2011, 2012, 2013, and 2014, we had many more isolates. Um, so interestingly, uh, in, in uh, 2011 and 2012, um, the isolates are fairly evenly dispersed across the neighbor joining tree, or up and down the neighbor joining tree. Um, but in 2013 and 2014, we could actually see some grouping by year. So these green isolates here um, in group A are 11 isolates all collected in 2014 uh, and they were collected from these states, Florida, Massachusetts, New York, North Carolina, and Idaho. So while Phytophthora infestans can fly a long way, uh, it, it's pretty unlikely that it, it would have the ability to fly from Florida to Idaho in the average season of the potato or tomato crop. So that was pretty interesting to us. Um, in group B, we had 14 isolates collected from 2013, again, um, with a fairly wide ranging group of states. Uh, when we tried to categorize these by state or region, we didn't come up with any groupings. But uh, when we did these categories by year, we came up with several groupings, even in just 166 isolates. One of the problems with this study is that we don't have the same number of isolates from any, every year, for sure. So yes, we need more data, but I was really excited about these initial data that we got. So, as I said, we did not see any evidence for geographic sublineages. So if all of our inoculum was coming from infected tubers, or there's been a report that tomato fruit, uh, the seed in tomato fruit can, can house uh, Phytophthora infestans over winter in Wisconsin. So if all of our inoculum were coming from local sources, we would expect to see regional uh, geographic sublineages, right? 
if all of our inoculum, if inoculum were not coming from local sources, but were, was rather being moved around on seedlings or tubers or people, um, then you might expect to see clustering by year. And that's what, what we see. So based on these data, um, my current hypothesis is that at least in some of those cases, the pathogen is moving lo long distances in a short period of time, probably in a truck. Um, and, and this is what everyone has assumed, that you know, the pathogen can move around. But it's really interesting to have some data to start to look at that. And certainly, um, you know, some of these individual lines here, um, when we get more data, we might see both regional you know, sublineages as well as annual sublineages. Because the most likely scenario is that both regional sources and trucked sources are uh, moving inoculum around the country. So in the last, so the last question, this is perfect, in the last two minutes, um, the area that we're going to be looking at next is will the pathogen be able to overcome host resistance? And when anyone asks this, a plant pathologist is always going to say, of course the pathogen will be able to overcome host resistance. History, 165 years of history, tells us that certainly the pathogen will overcome host resistance. But can we get some data to back that up? So one of the areas of plant pathology that I have been watching from the sideline is a really fascinating area of studies on effectors. It actually has its own little term called effectoromics. Effectors are uh, proteins that are secreted by plant pathogens to help them infect the plant. And one of the interesting things about effectors is that R proteins from plants will recognize the effector and that's how the R protein works. So if we can get a better idea of what effectors are present in a pathogen population and you guys have enough diversity in our genes, then we might be able to say, hey, this field has this set of effectors, Missouric, what plant do we want to put there? That would be awesome. That's like precision agriculture at the pathology breeding level. And, and I absolutely believe that <coughs> this will be possible within the next 20 years. The reason I believe that is because of my friends Paul Birch and Ingo Hein at the James Hutton Institute. And um, they came up with this technology that they called in effector enrichment and sequencing. And I personally did not come up with, it, with their name, but it's called F and Seek. <laughs> <laughs> and Paul said, you always know if the audience is listening when you say F and Seek. Um, so F and Seek, uh, what they have done is they have made uh, biotinylated RNA baits for a huge number of effectors from both Phytophthora infestans and Phytophthora capsaicae. Um, they have from Phytophthora capsaicae, the oomycetes, the most famous type of effector, is an effector that has a, a protein motif, an amino acid motif called RXLR. So they have 509 RXLR effectors in capsaicae. And then in capsaicae, there's also an interesting group of effectors called crinklers. Uh, because when they uh, infiltrated them into Nicotianum and Thamion, it crinkled the leaf. Um, anyway, uh, so they have 65 uh, crinkler effectors. And then in infestans, you can see um, they have uh, a lot of uh, effector baits for infestans as well. So they have these RNA baits that are ready to go that have been biotinylated. And the way it works is you take your genomic DNA from each of the isolates of interest. Uh, you uh, cut it, add an adapter so that you'll be able to amplify it in the end, take your RNA bait, hybridize them together. The, as I said, the RNA bait is um, coated in biotin. Then you take your streptavidin, coated magnetic beads, put them together, the streptavidin binds to the biotin, you add a magnet because the magnetic beads will then come to the magnet. You have your little pool of effectors, you then um, degrade the RNA away, and you have, after amplifying, the entire effector set of every isolate that you can then sequence. 
So they've done this on a small number of isolates, and it's been effective. They've done it on isolates that have genome sequences, so they know the effector complement that's there. What these guys don't have is a huge collection of isolates that you could then identify the effectors and go back and test them on host plants to see if that pathogen was then susceptible or resistant on that host plant, so validation. So that is our next step. Uh, for both the Phytophthora capsicae and the Phytophthora infestans, um, we plan to perform F and Seq uh, with the folks at James Hutton. Um, Again, as I said, this will give us some functional testing of the uh, alleles and allelic variants that they have identified to see um, if an allelic variant uh, will actually enable, enable to the, path the pathogen to get around the resistance of the plant. The goal would then have this lead to a diagnostic where, in fact, you could go into a field fairly rapidly, get 50 isolates, determine what effectors they have, and then figure out what would be the best plant to put in that field. For capsicy, that would work because you have relatively few new individuals coming into a field. For infestans, um, what would be really interesting is to understand the variability of effectors within those asexual clonal lineages. You know, so Bill Fry's lab has some, some evidence that there is some variability, especially in the older lineages, but it would be really fascinating to know what kind of variability there is that would help us manage the pathogen. And also, it would be interesting to see if the effector variability um, corresponded in any way to the variability within lineage that we saw with the GBS. So, even though, I hope you agree, that even though uh, two Phytophthora species are di very different, uh, my lab has been able to use similar strategies to understand the pathogen populations, and by understanding these populations, um, we firmly believe that we will be able to improve disease management strategies. Acknowledgements, uh, this is my lab here on the right. The Phytophthora capsicy work was done by a previous student, Amara Dunn, along with Marin Carlson. The infestans work uh, yeah. done by Zach Hansen, and uh, Marin did a lot of the bioinformatics. A uh, whole <coughs> list of collaborators. We've been funded by, uh, for the capsicy through the state of New York, um, Department of Ag and Markets, uh, along with uh, several different grant panels from NEFA, a long list of collaborators that are also very important. And with that, I will answer any questions. <laughs> ah, yes. Yeah, so the question is, is there a possibility of hybridization between capsicy and infestans? And um, in some Phytophthora species, you can hybridize, but not these two. So the question is, um, do we know which R genes map with which or match with which effectors? And in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. Um, for, <laughs> for the defeated R genes, uh, we, tend to, we tend to know what they are. Um, for uh, some, actually, in the, for the R gene that's most common in pepper, we do not know. Um, the effector yet, but there are a lot of folks working on that. So I feel like by the time we were to a point where we could actually do some field-based diagnostic, that information would be available. I should ask for questions from Geneva. Right, so Larry's, Larry's question is, what's driving that change in uh, population structure and infestant? So there's really one dominant clonal lineage. Um, and, and the answer is that no one knows for sure, but uh, my hypothesis is that um, th that particular clonal lineage is, is being dispersed widely. It was widely found in several regions that um, are both tomato transplant production and uh, potato seed production. And um, so, so I think it's just at the moment the lineage that's being most widely dispersed. What we've seen, um, history would tell us that in the next two or three years, we'll have a new clonal lineage that arrives probably from Mexico that is bigger and beefier and has less genetic bottlenecks and that will start to take over the, over the world. But it would be fantastic if that one same clonal lineage stayed around a bit longer because we actually know how to control it. Why do you say you think it would come up from Mexico? Oh, right, so why, why would it come up from Mexico? Um, so Mexico is the center of origin of Phytophthora infestans, 
and it has a sexually reproducing population, and we have a fairly si significant trade with the country of Mexico. So the most likely source of entry would be Mexico, um, just because that's where the largest amount of diversity is. Um, in other parts of the world, the pathogen is predominantly clonal, so if we get a new lineage from somewhere else in the world, we would immediately know that because those lineages are already known. In the back? Ooh. Right, so uh, Matthew's question is, the uh, founding O spores last about three years based on the data that we've seen, that inbre inbred O spores last longer. We don't actually know that. Um, wh wh we'll find that out. Um, what we know right now is that, that they're there. I, my guess, just I guess because what I've seen in growers' fields, the pathogen remains for a fairly long time. Um, so that's probably why I said, oh, they, chances are they last longer. But, and, and over time you'll get new, new inbreds, right? I guess my thinking would be that any O spore will live for three years, but after you, you lose the founders, like in Marin's little diagram, you know, the guys over here are always going to be inbreds. Um, what we don't know is if we're going to see a reduction in pathogenicity due to inbreeding. And we, it's hard to tell that in a grower field because you never know if new inoculum has come in but we should be able to see that in our field. Right, so how much genetic variation is there um, within a clonal lineage or among, among be between, between the clonal lineages? Yeah, because that's supposed to be very bad, right? Variation. Right, so within lineage variation is more rare between, than between lineage variation. And the numbers for between lineage variation with our GBS data are known, but I don't have them off the top of my head. But there's much more variation between the lineages than within the lineage. So it, it is true that this is the first time that um, we've really been able to look at variation within a clonal lineage. Um, with uh, microsatellites, um, a lineage, you know, all of the 166 isolates were not identical, but about 150 of them had the exact same SSR genotype with 12 microsatellite loci. Um, there were some variants, um, and so a variant individual, I think there were maybe 10 to 15 variants, would have a new allele at one of the 12 loci. It, interestingly, when we looked at those variants and the location in the neighbor joining tree, the GBS data was unrelated to whether or not there was a SSR variant. That's what we know. Okay, if there are no further questions, thanks, Chris. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.